Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. We thank you for uh, your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together, to draw from you, to learn from you, to be strengthened in the faith. We ask, dear Holy Spirit, that you speak to our hearts. We ask that you instruct us in all righteousness in the name of Jesus Christ. Grant unto us the experience of your word. I pray, Lord, that you grant me utterance to speak your word with power, with simplicity, and speaking as your oracle, that I may declare by the power of utterance exactly what is in your heart, the way you intend it to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, one more time, good evening and welcome to, I mean, it's evening where, where I am. So good evening and welcome to today's Bible study. Um, I'm excited because we're starting a new conversation we are starting a new uh topic and uh it's titled the word of life so the topic is the word of life and i want to give us a bit of background because um it's just to help our understanding all right i want to give us a bit of context to what we mean by the word of life all right um and to do that let's take a step back to just looking at scripture generally when you read scripture you see things like um, especially in the New Testament now, you see things like the word of salvation or the word of faith or the word of righteousness, the word of grace and all of that. Um, and when, when we say the word of life, for example, what we're talking about is the message of life. Okay? So the, the word word or is here is translated as message. So you can say the message of life. And in scripture, there are five <clears throat> core messages like this. Uh, when you read through scripture, especially the New Testament, you see five of such messages. And I just want to take us quickly through them before we zoom in into the word of life. Okay. Um, the first of these, you see, I'm not, this is not in any particular order. Okay. This is just me listing them out in the way I, I wrote them out here. Number one is the word of righteousness. The word of righteousness. And I think this is pretty clear. Uh, but let me read scriptures just to back this up. Uh, so the first part would be, I guess, first part of this teaching would be a bit um, academic. Okay, just to prove some things and show you some things through scriptures. Hebrews chapter 5 verse <clears throat> verse, um, verse 12. We read Hebrews 5, 5 verse 12 to, to 14. It says, For when for the time, when for, for the time, Ye ought to be teachers. It says, You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. So he was saying, By this time, you ought to be teachers, but you are still requiring to be taught the elementary or the fundamentals of the word of God. Then he goes on to say that you need milk, not meat. And now he, want, he, he, he went further to describe what, what he was saying. Verse 13 says, for everyone that uses milk is a is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So the person who feeds on milk is a baby, just like um, in in natural sense, uh, a child feeds on milk. You wouldn't see an adult, you know, looking for breast milk or even you know formula, <clears throat> and says, "Oh, that's what I'm eating." So I'm just drinking naan or I'm drinking SME. It's only a baby that does that. So Paul was saying the same way that if you're looking for milk. You are still, if you are feeding on milk, you are still a baby. But look at what else he says. He says, the person who feeds on milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. So one of the characteristics of babies in Christ is that they are unskillful in the word of righteousness or <clears throat> unskillful in the message of righteousness. So there is the word of righteousness, okay? And that's just what I want to point out from this scripture so that I don't, you know, deviate into more explanation. But there is the word of righteousness. There is the message of righteousness. And I wrote here in my notes that the word of righteousness is the message of victory and overcoming, okay? The word of righteousness is the message of victory and overcoming. Victory over sin, overcoming um, the sinful nature and the or the fallen nature and the flesh. It is that word of righteousness. That's what the, the predominantly the message, message of righteousness contains. Uh, it is the message that highlights your victory in Christ Jesus. You know, when the Bible says that uh, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, it is the message of righteousness that embodies that, where our seated position, and that's a position of victory, Okay. 
And, uh, you know, uh, the Bible talks about us being more than conquerors. It's, again, it's the message of righteousness that embodies that. Where we did not fight the battle, yet the Bible calls us more than conquerors. We did not go into the war. We did not draw our sword. We did not uh, uh, fight the enemy. We just obtained the victory that was handed over to us through Jesus Christ. So that's the message of righteousness. It's the word of righteousness that embodies that. Um, and let me just say something here that I've said before. And if you've listened to me for a bit, you, you'll hear me say this. That the um, people who dwell so much on this level of revelation, you'll find them emphasizing so much on the finished work of Christ, so much on what Christ did for us on the cross, and they hardly talk about the cross that we ought to carry, which is our responsibility to the gospel. So they, they talk a lot about what God has done for us, which is the starting point, and it is super important. You cannot build your Christian life on your works. It is not possible, not at any point in time. However, when people dwell only on such revelation, they likely end up in error because they, they zoom so much on what Christ has done and they don't realize that after what Christ has done for us, there is what we will do for Christ, not as a contribution to our salvation, but as a result of our salvation. Do you see that? But anyways, that's not our topic today, so I won't dwell on it. So there's the word of salvation, all right? Oh, there's the word of, sorry, word of righteousness. Um, number two, there is the word of grace, okay? And this is found in just, I'm reading just one verse to highlight this. There are several verses we could, we could explore. But uh, a verse to highlight this is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Look at what uh, Apostle Paul said here. He said, and now brethren... I commend you to God or I hand you over to God. He says, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. So there's such a thing called the word of grace, okay, and or the message of grace. And I said here in my notes that the word of grace is the message of empowerment. That's why you see, let me say that again, the word of grace is the message of empowerment. That's why you could see um, Apostle Paul says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. So the word of his grace empowers you. It builds you up. All right. Just want to check something. Um, just make sure I. OK, gotcha. So the word of his grace builds you up. It empowers you. That's the word, the message of grace. The message of grace is not an excuse to sin. No, no, no. It's not, um, it's not just saying, oh, God gave me this thing freely, so let me do anything I want. No. The message of grace is really an empowering message. It's a message that says, like Apostle Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. He says, I am not even qualified to be an apostle based on my, 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 my experience, based on the things I've done, based on my human qualification. I do not qualify to be called an apostle. Soon. But he says, I am what I am by the grace of God. It's that message that empowers you to do the things that God has asked you to do. It's the message of empowerment. He says, um, Paul says, uh, which is able to build you up and then give you an inheritance among those who which are sanctified. So that's the message of grace, okay? And you find that in, in scripture. The third message or the third word we see here is the word of the kingdom. The word of the kingdom and the scripture here is in Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 to 19. I, I do hope you are taking notes. Um, and I, I want to trust that as God leads us, we'll be able to explore these messages in you know in depthly. And, and in, in time past, we honestly have done um, we've covered some of these, but as God directs and permits, we'll do that again. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. It says, and um, for just for context, Jesus Christ had spoken a parable here and a very popular parable, which is the parable of the seed and the sower. And look at what he says in his explanation. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. He says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then cometh the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart, this is he which received the seed by the wayside. So the parable that Jesus was speaking about in, 
in in general terms we can say yes the the seed is the word right from that parable we say oh the seed is the word of god and just was talking about the word of god and that's that's correct won't be wrong to say that but in context from jesus's interpretation he says the anyone who hears the word of the kingdom so more specifically jesus christ was referring to the message of the kingdom in this is parable and so there's such a thing as the message of the kingdom where it is the kingdom of god that is the central fo- focus of that message and i said here that the word of the kingdom is the message of influence and dominion when we talk about the word of the kingdom or the message of the kingdom we're talking about the message of influence and dominion where we're talking about um, territories or, or kingdoms trying to exert dominion over the territories of the earth but beginning from the territories of men's hearts do you see that that the way god exerts dominion on earth is that he first exerts dominion over our hearts and that's why jesus christ started this parable by talking about uh, the seed of the word planted in the hearts of men where it says this the ground or the soil is the heart of men and that's the beginning of the influence of god's kingdom if god wants to conquer the world he will first conquer you and then use you to conquer the world only those who have been conquered by God can eventually conquer their world, wherever or whatever that world, world may represent, whether geographically, economically, or otherwise. God will first have to conquer your heart before he then conquers, uses you to conquer the world. And if you continue in this room, uh, Matthew chapter 13, you see that right after the parable of the seed and the sower, Jesus told, told another parable of a seed and a sower, but with a different meaning. He then says that a man, you know, went to, to, to plant seed in his farm and then the enemy came and sowed tears. And in this parable, Jesus said the wheat or the good seed are the sons of, of God, where, while the um, tares or the wheat are the sons of the devil. All right. So the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. Well, if I, let, me, let me just read it out for you. Um, he says, um, let me read this in, in verse, in verse, um, Hmm. In verse chapter 13, verse, verse look, look at verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that sows the good seed is the son of man. He says, The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. So do you see the progression here? This is in verse 38. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Let me explain this. In the previous parable, the seed was the word. The soil was the was the hearts of men, okay. Um, uh, and the message, the message, the good seed was the the w- message of the kingdom. The the seed was the word of the kingdom. Now, when anyone receives this word and it it germinates out, out of the four categories, the one category that is God is looking for and God is aiming to achieve are those who who produced you know thirty, sixty, and hundredfold. But then in the next parable. The Bible lets us know that there's another kind of seed that is planted. This time around, the seed is the, are the children of the kingdom. Who are the children of the kingdom? The children of the kingdom are those who have received the word of the kingdom and it produced results and they have become the children of the kingdom. And so those children of the kingdom are now planted in the world. And the purpose is to influence the world. So my point being that the message of the kingdom is the message of influence and the influence starts first from your heart. Where God conquers your heart and then plants you in the world and uses you to conquer your world. It will therefore becomes an aberration when you are, are planted in a region that you ought to conquer, but the region ends up conquering you. It's it's an anomaly. It's it's off the script of God. Okay, so that's the message of the kingdom in in, in summary, where God wants to ex- exert influence and dominion, and every spirit is seeking for that expression. Every spirit is aiming for dominion. If you look at what's going on in the world, in the music industry, entertainment industry, in finance, in everywhere, you see that the enemy is trying to exert dominion, even over your children, introducing introducing ideologies that are contrary to God. In the same way too, God wants to exert dominion. He wants to introduce his mindset. He wants the earth to be filled with the knowledge of God, just as the waters cover the sea. But the only way he can do that is by first and foremost conquering your heart or influencing your heart and then using you to conquer and influence the world. Do you see that? So that's that's the message of the kingdom. Um, that's what number number three. Number four, we have 
the word of life, which is our focus for today. And I'll just say something briefly about this because we'll, this is where we'll dwell on. All right. So the word of life. And just to give you an anchor scripture or, or you know, one scripture that points to this is First John chapter 1 and verse 1. First John chapter 1 verse 1. We have the word of life. First John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. So there is such a thing called the word of life or the message of life. All right? And the message, uh, how I put it here, is that the word of life is the message of manifested divinity. The word of life is the message of manifested divinity. You know why we read says that which we've heard, that which we've seen, that which we've looked upon, which our hands have handled of the word of life. Let me add verse 2. You see what I mean? Verse 2 says, for the life was manifested. That's where I got my phrase from. Manifested divinity. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested unto us. So the word of life is the message of manifested divinity where God is seeking to find expression on the earth and he does that by imparting his life onto us so that we can manifest his life everywhere. So that if someone says, I've never heard of God, I've never known that there is a God, but if they come in contact with us, we will manifest the qualities and the properties of God so that we become the mirror of God. We become the lens through which people can see God. All right, that's the message of, of life. That's the word of life. But again, we'll, that's our focus, so we'll come back to it. Number five and final one is the word of faith. The word of faith or the message of faith. Romans chapter 8, verse 8 to verse 10. Romans chapter 8, verse 8 to verse 10. Uh, no, 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 that's not so Romans. Um... Sorry, Romans chapter 10, I beg your pardon, not chapter 8. Romans chapter 10, verse 8 to 10. It says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, um, and in thy heart, in thy heart rather, it says, That is the word of faith which we preach. The word of faith which we preach. Verse 9 says, That if we shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and he says, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth salvation, confession rather, is made unto salvation. He says, what does the word say? It is near thee in thy heart and in thy mouth. He says, this is the word of faith that we preach. So there's such a thing called the word of faith or the message of faith, all right? And um, the message of faith or the word of faith, like I said here, is the message of salvation, deliverance, and possibilities. The word of faith is the message of salvation, deliverance, and possibilities. All right? It's in the, under the word of faith that you experience salvation, just, just like we're, 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 uh, what we read now. All right? Uh, it's under the word, message of faith that you experience de- deliverance. It's under the message of faith that you experience possibilities. Where you go to Hebrews chapter 11 and you see that women receive their, their dead back to life. You see that um, um, impossible things were possible because of faith. And, and Hebrews 11 attributes it, to, attributes it to faith. So it is in the war, under the message of faith or the word of faith that we see such possibilities that, in fact, the Bible says it is then impossible to please God without faith. So the only possibility, only chance we have of pleasing God is through the window that faith makes available. Okay? And we see all of that under the word of faith. All right, so I just want to give us a broad scope and more like a, um, a just a wide view before we narrow into the focus for today. And just to, to let you know that there are five core messages all through scripture or five core words all through scripture. The word of uh, the word of righteousness, the word of grace, the word of the kingdom, the word of life and the word of faith. Now, having said this, I want us to move into the focus for today, which is the word of faith. Oh, sorry, the word of life, I beg your pardon, which is the word of life. Uh, But just before we continue, I want to implore you at this point, please, if you're live on the call, uh, invite someone to join us right away. It's it's not too late. We still have have about 30 or 40 minutes at at most. 
um, for today's Bible study. So please, I implore you to invite someone. And in case you're listening to this later on on YouTube, uh, please, this will be a good time to like, subscribe, so that the algorithm, you know, shares it to more people and we are able to reach more people. Uh, also, go a step further. Get the link and share it with someone. There's a higher chance that the person will listen to this message uh, because you shared it with them. All right, so let's do that in uh, maybe 10 of or 20 seconds okay invite someone if you've not posted on your whatsapp or instagram you know post it share it uh, share it with someone and let them know that hey uh it's time for a bible study we're having a fantastic time and you will be blessed if you do so okay so let's go into the word of faith sorry i keep saying the word of faith the word of life the word of life the word of life all right let's read acts chapter 5 verse 17 to verse 19 acts chapter 5 verse 17 to 19 all right i want to read this from the new king james version acts chapter 5 verse 17 acts chapter 5 verse 17 all right if you are there say uh-huh uh-huh if you know what i mean okay so Acts 5 verse 17, look at what the Bible says. Then the high priest, <clears throat> then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. They were so angry at the, at the disciples. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But look at what happened in verse 19. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. You know, there are very few times in scripture where you see um, angels giving instructions as to the message that should be preached. There are very few times in scripture where you see that an angel categorically told them what to say, what to speak. All right. Um, and this is one of such few times. But before this, right, the apostles continued to, you know, heal the sea, continue to do wonders. After even after they had been, in, if you go to chapter four, just the previous chapter of Acts, chapter of the book of Acts, you see that the apostles were threatened not to preach in the name of Jesus Christ again. They were even flogged. All right, this was after they had healed the man at the beautiful gate. But they didn't stop. They continued. And the word got to the Pharisees and they felt like they were losing ground. And so they called the people and they, they locked them up in the prison in an attempt to constrict the word of God from spreading, in an attempt to, um, to uh, what's this word now, to, to quarantine the word of God, all right, so that it doesn't spread further. But they didn't know that they can't stop the eternal life of God from, from find, finding expression. They can't stop the word of God from moving forward. And so what happened is very instructive. An angel came and an angel came to open the doors of the prison and not just setting them free. Because if the angel set them free, that's enough. Because we would have said, oh, the, we, God wanted his gospel to, to spread forth, for, further. rather, And that's why the angel came. He brought a deliverance and that's fantastic. But the angel gave them an important instruction. He said, said in verse 20, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. So the angel came to deliver an important message in addition to uh, setting them free from the prison. What was the message? Go and preach about this life. Go and preach about the life of God. Because you see, the gospel was at such a time that it was in its infancy, if we may put it that way, that it was just beginning to spread. They were even still at Jerusalem. They had not gotten to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, as Jesus Christ had instructed. They were still at Jerusalem, all right? So it was still at the, the gospel was at the early stage, or Christianity was at its early stages. And the, and the angel came with an instruction for the apostles that they should go and preach about this life. What this tells us is that one of the first things every believer should understand and be acquainted with is the word of life, is the message of the life of God. Because when we come, you know, when we, when we come do an altar call, what we typically say is, oh, come and give your life to Christ. But that is just one half of it. In fact, that to me is the second half of it. The first half of it is that you will come to receive the life of Christ first and foremost. 
then we give our lives to Christ. And like I've said, you know, uh, some weeks ago in Bible study, that the act of giving our lives to Christ is not a one-time thing. It's an everlasting thing. We'll continue to do it until we, we, we meet Jesus because it's very progressive. We give our lives to Christ in so many layers. On, on that first day, we, see, we declare our dedication to God and Jesus as our Lord. But uh, it doesn't end there because three months later, God sees that there's a particular character trait he needs to, to, needs to solve in us and then he requires us to give up that part of our lives. And we keep giving our lives to Christ in, in several layers and dimensions. But on the day we, we accept Jesus, we receive his life. And so the angel was saying to, to the disciples in essence that these people that have received the life of God, they need to know about this life. It's not just enough that they received it in their spirit. They need to be acquainted with the dictates of this life. And so go to the temple, speak the word, speak, look how we say, speak to the people all the words of this life. What this tells me is that this must have been very important to the heart of God for God to deploy an angel to set the uh, apostles free and give them these instructions. It must have been important to God. All right. So he says, go and preach all the words of this life. So there's the message of the life that you carry. There's the teaching of this life that you carry. There's a message that instructs us on the life we carry. You know, the Bible says that he that is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. What this means is that your current reality in the realm of the spirit is new. It is new especially to you. All right? And you have to be instructed in the way of life so that you can... Um, you can benefit from its experience. Hallelujah. All right, so that's first scripture we're reading. Second scripture is what we read in um, just a while ago in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. All right, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Let me just take a quick drink of water. Okay, so 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, it says, That which was from the beginning. That which was from the beginning. And I want to say something here. And we will later see he was talking about the life of God. That means the life of God was from the beginning. From the beginning. Um, this is an attempt to give us a, a sort of an origin of where the life of God sits. And what he says is that the, that which was from the beginning, from the beginning. Now, it doesn't say it was created. It says it was from the beginning because verse 2 says the life manifested. The life wasn't created. The point of manifestation did not signify the beginning of its existence. It had been in existence long from the beginning. All right. But it manifested at a particular time. Now, what I'm saying is this, that this life was from the beginning. That means it predates earth. And that is to say that there is nothing that originates from earth that can quench that which dates back to the beginning. What I'm saying again is this, that anything that the life of God sponsors in your, in your life or your experience, there is nothing in time that can overcome what was initiated by the life of God which existed from the beginning. I hope you see that. That if the life of God produces anything in your life currently or your experience currently, there is nothing in this earth, in time, that can take away from what the life of God has done because the life of God is superior to it. It was from the beginning. From the beginning. It says that which was from the beginning. And that's how I know that the will of God for your life, the purposes of God for your life, the things that God has released into your life, which comes from the beginning, originates from the life of God, there's nothing in time that can take it away. No matter the threat of the devil, accident, poverty, lack, whatever it is, it cannot destroy that which was from the beginning. That which is produced from the life of God. Hallelujah. So let's continue reading. John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which our eyes, sorry, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. It says, concerning the word of life. You know, before I continue, this verse 1 gives us a progression of experience. All right? It says, that which our eyes have, which our that's which we've heard rather and most times we begin to hear about god 
uh, well, we, our first encounter with God is from what we hear. Maybe a message, a sermon, a testimony. Maybe someone shares a testimony and that's the beginning of, of what we, our experience with God is that we hear about it. Then the next progress is, is this. That it says, which we have seen with our eyes. In other words, we witness it. And that's the next layer. So I, somebody heard about God and then maybe reluctantly or out of, you know, several invitations comes to church and then he now sees with his own eyes. He sees what these people are talking about. He, he has heard about God, but now he has seen it. That's what um, 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 Job said. He says, I've heard about you with the hearing of the ears, but now my eyes have seen you. So there is now a personal witness to, to the things of God or to the experience of God. But then there's a step further. He says, which we have looked upon. When he says looked upon, this is an investigative effort where you have you see something you have not witnessed god but you want to go deeper you want to look upon it you want to investigate it that's what happened happened with uh, moses that he saw the bush burning <clears throat> but it wasn't he saw the bush burning but he first came nearer and he wanted to investigate why the bush was on fire but it wasn't consumed and you see if you want to when God wants to suck you into an experience of him, this is these are the layers he typically will take you through. When he wants to bring you maybe into a particular anointing, he'll, he'll first cause you to hear about it. Let's say the healing anointing as an example. He'll first cause you to hear about, let's say you hear about a minister that works in healing anointing and you hear about some, some dramatic testimonies and you are, you are wild. And then second thing is that he brings you into an environment where you witness it for yourself. That means you look upon it with your, your, you see it with your eyes rather. He brings you into an environment, let's say you go for a meeting and you see that dimension of, of anointing in manifestation. He, God causes you to see it. What God is doing is that he's gradually sucking you into the experience. And you, if you investigate your life, you will bear witness that this has happened to you. So the third layer is you look upon it. And like I said, that's what um, um, Moses, uh, that's the experience that Moses had. That Moses saw the bush burning, so he came closer to inspect. How can a bush be on fire but not consumed? And it was in that process of inspecting that God now encount encountered him. All right? And then the, th the fourth layer, which now the, the consummation of our experience, is when he says, our hands have handled so it started off by you hearing about this dimension of God, but then you now witnessed it and you began to inspect. And sometimes inspecting or, you know, the Bible says, which we have looked upon, it, it, it sometimes come across as studying the word of God or reading by, um, um, biographies of people who have worked in such dimensions. All right. You study it. Sometimes it's even just observing closely a, a man of God that you have access to. So you are looking upon it. You are studying it. You are soaking in such possibilities. And I'm telling you, this is how spiritual realities are transmitted. The, the things we hear of, you know, the Bible says that we should imitate those who through faith and patience obtained the prize. All right. The Bible says these things are written aforehand that through the example of scripture, we might find hope. These things that we read in the word of God is not so that we have interesting stories to tell. It's so that we can be sucked into the experience of it. You can pick a man like Elijah, for instance, and say, how can a man like Elijah call down fire? And then you begin to look upon it, look upon it, and God brings you into the dimension where you can call down fire. You hear of a man like John the Baptist, who had such a boldness to speak to people in authority, even soldiers, he told soldiers, repent you vipers, you brood of vipers, stop collecting bribes from them. How can a man speak to people in armed forces like that with such boldness and authority and they could not arrest him? They could not kill him, they could not do anything to him. That kind of dimension, you read it, you begin to look upon it, you soak it in and then the boldness is imparted to you. And let me tell you, any grace that you see and you desire, this is how you, are, you, you, you tap into it. This is how you realize it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I tell you that the possibilities I've seen in my life that I have drawn from, from other men and women of God that embodied such possibilities, it came this way. So the Bible says we first hear about it. Our, we see it with our eyes. Then we look upon it. We look intensely. Some other times, the way looking upon it um, uh, manifests is... In a place of meditation, 
You just close your eyes and you see yourself preaching to thousands of people, laying hands on the sick and they are healed, speaking the word of God and demons go. You are looking upon it. That's what it means. You are, you are absorbing the possibilities in your spirit, man. And I'm telling you again that I can tell you from experience that this is how I have seen some things manifested. The first time I spoke, I spoke the word of God, or one of the times I spoke the word of God, or just in a place of prayer, and people were just falling under the anointing of God. It was, it was because before then, I was in a place of prayer prolonged. And one of the images I settled in the place of prayer was, was that image that I didn't need to be touching people. And, you know, people now say, ah, he's pushing them. That's why they are funny. I know those kind of stories. I say, I don't want them. If the power of God is real, then let it break out by itself. And that's how I saw that such possibilities. Okay? And so, it's the same concept that um, Jacob applied for his cattle, for the sheep, where he he took a branch of a leaf and and peeled the back so, um, the back of it to make like dots all over that all over that branch, and he put it in the water where the animals would drink from. And the Bible says, as the animals came to drink, they would normally mate, and that's they'll have intercourse. And as they had intercourse, they will look at that um, that branch of 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 wood that Jacob had peeled, you know, and put there. They will look at it, and even though these animals, by their DNA, they did not have any spot on their skin, but when they give birth, they will give birth to what they looked at, not what they, or who they were. Do you see what I'm saying? And this is a, a possibility and a, a, a dimension in the realm of the spirit that you might have come from a background where nobody rose, nobody became successful, nobody was influential, nobody was, you know, historically, nobody really was known. But the Bible says if you can look at the word of God, you will produce your, the word of God and not your genealogy. You produce the word of God and not your history. You produce the word of God and not your human DNA. That's what the word of God is saying. So the Bible says that which we have looked upon and the ultimate result is that you will handle what you eventually look upon. And I don't know why God, God is allowing me to make an emphasis here, but I believe it is for someone that the possibilities in the realm of the spirit, he wants you to manifest. This is how you manifest them. Is I know prophecy has come to you that you will be this, you will be that, you do this and you do that. That's great. But take it a step further. You will have heard it. Now, see it with your eyes, look upon it, and eventually your hands will handle it. Hallelujah. Okay, so I, I didn't mean to make this emphasis, but I believe God, by his spirit, wants us to do, to, to do this. All right? So, go to verse 2. It says, so verse 1 ends, and say, ends by saying, concerning the word of life, concerning the message of life, the embodiment of life. Verse 2 proceeds. It says, the life was manifested. And like I said earlier, the time of manifestation is not the time of creation or the time of its existence. The life has always been in existence. And if we draw back, which we will do, we'll go back to Genesis. We'll see that God's design has for us, for us rather, has always been to experience this life. But it says the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness. We have seen and we bear witness and declare to you that that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us verse 3 let me end here that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ okay so it says the life was manifested and this is the life i want us to look at the word of life um that was manifested this is what i want us to look at all right um Okay, uh, so yeah, let's move on. Now, in 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 life generally, and and I'm trying to not you know, I'm trying to not get us confused by the use of the word life, so we can use, have the proper context. But let me say this: in human experience, okay, there are two systems that sponsor human experience, and we will see this in the book of Genesis. Number one, let me just mention it: there, there is the system. Of the knowledge of good and evil and then number two there is the system of life all right so two systems that can sponsor human experience is number one either the knowledge of good and evil or the experience of life but let's look at genesis chapter 2 verse 9 <clears throat> genesis chapter 2 
and verse 9. Please just a moment, let me take some water so my throat isn't parched. Okay. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. Um, we're familiar with this, with the story of creation and what happened after that. So I wouldn't go into that wide explanation. I'll just zoom in. Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 says, And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So every tree that God created was pleasant to the site that it was good looking and it was good for food all right so note note this because we'll come back to it but let's continue the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so we see two trees in the middle of the garden and i believe that they were positioned in the middle of the garden to represent uh, the the importance or to represent how they stand out from every other every other fruits or every other tree that was in the garden so these two trees represent the two systems that sponsor human experience number one it says the tree of life number two is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so i'm going to explain this and see how this fits into our current experience okay but let's go to chapter 15 uh, sorry chap chapter 2 verse 15 so the same chapter but verse 15 all right or we 15 to 17 then the lord god took the man and put him in the garden of eden to tend and to keep it so god put the man in the garden of eden primarily to tend and to, to keep it and the lord god commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may eat freely but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God was saying essentially that from the two systems that they that were planted in the garden, right? You cannot eat from the system or from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which represents that system of experience. So there are two, two trees planted there. And like I said, these two trees represent the two um, systems that sponsor human experience. And God explicit, explicitly told man... You shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's the same thing today that God is saying your experience should not come from the system of the knowledge of good and evil. And what is this system? Again, we're, we're getting there and I'll explain to you. But I want to show you something here and uh, just to compare uh, uh, and as we explain further. Genesis chapter 3 <clears throat> verse 6. Look at what the serpent said to the woman. Or oh, no, rather, look at what the woman noticed, all right? After the serpent had told the woman that um, God knows if you eat of this tree, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil and all of that. Look at verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3. So the woman saw the tree, saw that the tree was good. So this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She said, she saw that the tree was good for food, <clears throat> number one. Note that. That it was pleasant to the eyes, number two. And a tree desirable to make one wise number three so she looked at this fruit and she deduced three things number one that it was good for food <clears throat> it was pleasant to the eyes and it had the ability to make one wise now let's go back to genesis <coughs> chapter 2 verse 6 um no genesis chapter 2 verse verse 9 rather verse 9 don't forget the three things she deduced look at what bible says and out of the ground the lord god made every tree that was Every tree to grow that is pleasant to the to sight. So we see that. And it was good for food. So of the three things that the woman noticed from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, two, two, thing, two of those things were common across every fruit in that garden. Because verse where we just read chapter 2 verse 9 says, um, God made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the eyes and good for food. So every tree in the garden was pleasant to the eyes and it was good for food. So that was not the distinguishing thing about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You agree with me? Because those two things were common to every fruit in the garden. The third thing was what really differentiated, differentiated the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what's the third thing? The woman said it's, she saw that it was desirable to make one wise. 
That was something that every other tree did not have. And when we say it was desirable to make one wise, what this wisdom suggested was a method of living that was aside God. You see that? Okay, so the main difference between the forbidden fruit and other fruits is the promise to make one wise. And when we talk about wisdom here, the fruit suggested a version of wisdom or a way of experience that was dissociated from God. So when he says he's able to make one wise, you know, go to chapter, chapter, yes, yeah, same chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 5. It says, for this was the serpent speaking, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes shall be open and you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. So what he was suggesting was a system of living. And that's what the woman saw that if I eat this fruit, it can make me wise. It can make me begin to live in a different way. And this different way, unfortunately, was declaring an independence of, from God. Was a system of living or a system of experience that was dissociated from God. That's why I said in the garden there were two systems. Number one is the, is the system of life which is represented by the tree of life and number two is the system of of good and evil which is the null which is represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so this was what really was the difference in, in that tree that the woman saw it and says ah, if i eat this fruit it can make me wise and wisdom here is the is is what the enemy suggests to us that we can live independent of god however on the contrary god actually designed us to live by life God designed our experience in humanity should be sponsored by life. This is God's, God's idea, all right? God wants us to live life by life. Let me put it that way. God wants us to have the human experience through life. What this means is that as we interact with, with the world, as we interact with things around us, how we deduce or how we derive information is based on life. Whereas what the devil sold to the, to, to the woman was a way of deriving information based on good and evil. And this judgment or this version of wisdom is independent, independent from God, is totally dissociated from God. Whereas the, the system of life is heavily and completely reliant on God. All right, do you see that? So these are the two systems. And even till today, and even as believers, there are two systems we can draw from. What the natural system is the knowledge of good and evil. Where we look at things and we try to judge them by what we see. And you see, the knowledge of good and evil is, is, the, is the system that draws information from our five senses. Okay? The system that draws information and instruction from our five senses. So when hear people say something like, hey, I'm, 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 I'm eating because I feel like eating now. Or, you know, someone says, ah, anything I crave for, I eat it all. I don't spare anything. If I crave for moi moi and vegetable soup, I will just buy it. It's what I crave for. If I crave to to have, uh, to, to, you know, maybe go to drink or get high, I just feel like getting high. I just go and get high, you know. We say, ah, oh, I saw that bag in the shop. I, I looked at it. I just wanted the bag. I just bought it. When you hear people make decisions and live their lives, from how they feel, from the notions of the five senses, then you know that these people are living under the system of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what that system suggests. That's the principle of that system. It's a system that um, brings information from your five senses or from your natural senses, and it gives instructions to you through those senses. So someone just says, ah, I know if you hold I must, I must do, they do. And they just go and act on their impulse. They act on their physical senses. Act on whatever, you know, um, whatever impulse that their senses, natural senses tell them to do. These people are living under the, the system of the knowledge of good and evil. That's why the Bible says, talks about carnal believers. Carnal believers, even though they are believers, are believers who live under the influence and under the suggestion and instruction of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the five senses, all right? That's how they live their life. But this is not how God wants us to live. God wants us to draw our information and draw our instruction on the basis of life. So we want to explain further what is this life really? What, what, how do we, what, what, what is really contained in it? But first of all, let's read John chapter 3 verse 16. 
I know you know this passage of scripture, but I want us to read it um, from the word of God. John chapter 3, verse 16. <clears throat> All right, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God's desire is for every one of us to have everlasting life. He gave his son to the entire world that anybody that can as much as believe in his son will have access to everlasting life. And the reason why God made eternal life or everlasting life such, so widely accessible is because he desires for every single one of us to experience it. And based on this, you now know that the reason why God put the tree of life in the middle of the garden was so that by a by any chance man would have located that tree and eaten from the tree of life because God wanted us to live our life from his life. The Bible says, with you is the fountain of life, talking about God. Then he says, in your light we see light. So with God is a fountain of life and it is from that fountain we draw our life from. And that's what God desires and that's how God um, destined that we should live, that we should live life based on his own life. We should, we should experience humanity or we should, um, our experience in humanity should be sponsored by his life. That's what his desire is. If you read John chapter 10, verse 10 again, and I'm, I'm sure this is a scripture that we are familiar with, but Gen John chapter 10, verse 10 says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. So this is the mission and, and, and ambition of the thief, to steal, to kill, and destroy. He says, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. So God intends for us to have life and have it abundantly. Other translation says, and have it to the fullest, so that there is no scarcity in our experience of the life of God. There is no scarcity anywhere you turn to, in your work, in your family, in your business, in your, even in your watching movie and you, you're playing football, you can experience the life of God. God, Jesus says that you have it in, in abundance. So this is the design of God and this is God's desire that we would experience life and have it to its fullest, okay? So this is what God desires for us, all right? Now, having known that the desire for, for uh, desire of God for us is to experience life to its fullest, I want to end today's Bible study by uh, attempting to give a definition to life and I'll mention two broad expressions of life and we'll stop there to be continued next week, okay? All right, so we'll do this in less than 10 minutes. Um, to give a definition of life, there's a passage in scripture that already does this. So let's just turn there. John chapter 17, verse 3. John chapter 17, verse 3. And something you just so you know, and if you haven't already noticed, is that the, the, the gospel of John, in fact, the writings of John carry, carry so much um, insight about the life of God. All right, more than any other book in the Bible, the writings of John, or more, than, or more than any other author in the Bible, the writings of Apostle John, right, the Gospel of John, and then the letters, first, second, and third John, they carry so much revelation about the life of God. So you might just find us reading, you know, several scriptures from it. So John chapter 17, verse 3, it says, let's start from verse 2. No, let's start from verse 1, all right? John chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. He says, glorify your son, that your son may be glorified, or that your son may glorify you rather, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. So everybody that comes to Jesus receives eternal life. This is 100% guaranteed. Verse 3, Jesus begins to define eternal life. He says, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. They may come to be acquainted with you. The knowledge referred to here is not just, it's not a head knowledge. It's an experiential knowledge. He says that they will know you, who um, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So this is how I coined it. Eternal life is the quality of existence derived from the knowledge of God 
and sponsored by our relationship with him. Let me say that again. Eternal life is the quality of existence derived from the knowledge of God and sponsored by our relationship with him. Remember I said this knowledge is not head knowledge. It's not knowledge about God. It is knowledge of God. The same way that you know your father. I mean, if you, you grew up with your father and your mother, you know your parents. You ought, Someone else, maybe your cousin might know about your parents based on what you told them. But you, you know your parents. So it is an experiential knowledge. So it says, or I said it here, it is derived from the knowledge of God. And number two, it is sponsored by our relationship with him. So eternal life cannot be in, con- you cannot have a conversation of eternal life without talking about a relationship with God. That is why even if somebody crams the whole Bible and knows how to quote the Bible, yet doesn't have a relationship with God, they don't have eternal life. That's, and this is obviously proven when, Jesus, when um, Satan in Matthew chapter 4 quoted scripture, right? He quoted scripture, but that doesn't mean he knew God. Doesn't mean he had a relationship with God. And or, or, consequently, he did not have eternal life. Okay. Um, second example is when the seven sons of Skipha went to cast out the, a demon from a demon possessed man. They said, I, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, that showed obviously that they did not have a relationship with the name of Jesus or with the person that they were invoking his name. And so the demon obviously didn't go. So eternal life, again, like I said, is the quality of existence derived from the knowledge of God and sponsored by our relationship with him. So you know God. Then you know, just Christ said, this is life eternal, that they may know you. They may come to a, a place of intimate knowledge of you, a knowledge that is can only be sponsored and fueled by a relationship with you, with you, O oh Lord. So Jesus Christ says, This is eternal life. Okay. Um, and now if this is true about eternal life, you know, one of the ways you can define things is by is by describing the experience, all right, or describing the experience with it. If you want to define a car, for instance, you can say, oh, a car is an automobile that is powered by by engine and all of that. But another way you can define it is by describing what a car does. You say a car is that machine that can move you from point A to point B faster, all right? Or you can describe maybe, if they say describe jollof rice as an example. You can describe jollof rice in every way you want to. One of the best ways you can describe jollof rice is by describing your experience with jollof rice. You can now say, when you eat jollof rice, it is so tasty. There's a blend of sesame seed and and curry and all of those things. You are now defining it by experience. So, what I want to do next week is to describe to us eternal life practically from experience or from its expression. And I'll just mention the two expressions and we'll close for today. The two main expressions of life is number one, communication or perception, and number two, ability. This is what I mean. That generally, even, even with human life or animal life or plant life, one of the ways you can, the lives are expressed or life is expressed generally is via the mode of communication or perception. All right. So for instance, if two dogs are barking, you guys are a human being. You don't know what the dogs are saying, but the dogs know what they are saying because they have the, the dog life, you know, if I may put it that way. So because they both have the dog life, as they are barking, they are communicating in their own way and they know what they are saying. Have you ever seen a trail of ants? Okay. Uh, have you ever studied a trail of ants? You see typically ants traveling in one, in one line or in a similar path. And... On the other side, if an, if an ant is coming from this direction and that ant is coming from this direction, I, I know some of you are wondering how I've noticed it, but, well, I have noticed it. You see, the ants, two ants, when they come together, they stop and it's almost like they have a communication and then they continue their individual journeys. Whatever they are saying there, you can't hear it, you don't understand it because you don't have the ant life. But the ants understand what they are saying because they have the ant life in them. So one of the ways you... One of the expressions of eternal life or the divine life is in in the mode of communication and perception. And this is obviously communication with God, you know, God to us and us to God, and also perception, which is 
is bundled as part of the communication, how we perceive the things of God, all right? So we're going to look at that next week. The second thing, second way life is expressed is ability, all right? So back to my examples of, of dog. Um, the best you can do is to imitate a dog barking, but you can't actually bark like a dog. And the reason why a, a dog barks is because the life it carries teaches it to bark. A dog doesn't go to a school of barking where they teach it the five ways to bark. No, a dog by itself, as it is born, it has inherently in it, in it the ability to bark. So ability also is one of the expressions of life. It's the same way that um, a, a bird can fly, but a dog cannot fly because the life of a bird, the, the nature of a bird gives it the ability to fly. Whereas the nature and the life of a dog doesn't give it the ability to fly. So one of the ways you understand life is from its abilities. And it is the same thing too in the, in, in, in the realm of the spirit. One of the ways you know that we have the life of God is from the abilities that we demonstrate. And if we, don't know, if we do not demonstrate abilities consistent with the life of God, people may be robbed of the experience of God because we are not manifesting it. The Bible says that the endless creation waits in, a, in, in eager anticipation for the manifestation of the sons of God. So creation is waiting for us to manifest the life, to release that ability. Okay? So this is where we're going to stop and we'll pick up from here next week. But don't forget, two ways life, life is expressed. Number one, through communication or perception. Number two is through abilities. All right. Okay, so this is where we're going to end. Uh, let's say a word of prayer as we close. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word that's come for to today. We thank you for utterance. We thank you for um, understanding. Thank you for your spirit that has make, made all things clear to us. We ask, oh Lord, that this truth continue to spread in our hearts and we are grounded and rooted in it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we've prayed. Amen. Hallelujah.